Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining another one of our Kronos Group hosted vulcanized webinars. Today we'll be, we'll be covering how to use synchronization validation across multiple queues and command, command buffers. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have questions during the presentation, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We're recording this webinar and we'll share the link along with the slides of the recording shortly. Watch for a follow-up email to come directly from Zoom, probably tomorrow or the next day. At the end of the session, please complete a short survey to help us better design future events. With that, let's get the webinar started. Um, I'd like to introduce John Zuloff of Lunar G. John, take it away. Thank you, Lizzie. Let me get my slides going. Can you see my slides? We can. All right. Well, welcome to uh, the uh, Vulcan synchronization and synchronization validation uh, presentation. I'm, again, John Zuloff at Lunar G. I've been doing graphics since uh, it came out on a printer. So uh, it's been uh, a great, uh, great journey here, and it's amazing what we can do today. So our goals today are to review Vulcan synchronization, understanding what's in the spec, the terminology, and some of the new features. Secondly, to look at how to validate uh, Vulcan, Vulcan synchronization. I, I saw in a comment on Reddit that said, on a scale of OpenGL to Vulcan synchronization, how difficult is it? So yes, Vulcan synchronization has a reputation for being difficult. And hopefully the tools that we show you will help you overcome some of those difficulties. Uh, we will also be uh, have some time for Q&A. So let's dive right in. So Vulkan, like other modern graphics APIs, doesn't do a lot to guarantee uh, that the commands you give are serialized. And in fact, it does as much as possible to allow tasks to happen in parallel for best performance. They are started in the order that they're submitted in queues, but they may execute in any order with a few uh, guarantees, for example, uh, operations on a given fragment uh, will operate in order so that your shaders won't uh, get confused and, and see primitives in the wrong order. But other than that, most of, most of Vulkan is not regulated in, in terms of order. So when we tell Vulkan what, um, how to, seri how, to, how to sequence these commands. We talk about the scopes. In terms of the order of operations, these are referred to as the first synchronization scope and the second synchronization scope. The first synchronization scope is what we will wait for, and the second synchronization scope is what waits for that first scope. Uh, I sometimes, you may hear me slip and talk about this as the source scope and the destination scope, simply because within the API, source and destination are almost uniformly used uh, when uh, both scopes are in an API call. So again, the source scope or the first scope is what we are going to wait for, and the second scope is what operations are going to wait. The other kind of dependencies, so that, that talks about the order of operations. Memory dependencies cover the fact that modern GPUs have quite complex memory hierarchies, uh, caches, uh, different zones potentially on a chip, different uh, operational subdomains, different operational units. So we need to explicitly make sure that not only our operations started, but they are finished and any pending memory writes 
are through the memory hierarchy to a point where the subsequent commands can use them. So again, like the synchronization scopes, we have access scopes. The first access scope is what memory accesses are guaranteed to happen before. And again, I may slip and call the source access scope because in many API calls, you'll see that as a source, source access mask. So what is going to be uh, made available? In other words, what's going to make its way all the way through the memory hierarchy before any accesses in the second access scope are allowed to uh, run? And also, this, uh, this invokes the concept of visibility, meaning that these will be readable or writable uh, by the operations in the second access scope. Uh, but again, only those things in the first access in the first access scope will, will are guaranteed. So what kinds of things can happen if we don't get this right? Well, these are the classic, mostly the classic list of uh, memory hazards you may be familiar with from multi-threaded CPU programming, read after write, where we don't know what that read will get. It may get the state of, of the last write or some write before it or partially one write and partially another write. So that, that happens when we don't wait for a write to be completed and propagated uh, through the memory hierarchy. Write after read, when we do this, this may mean that prior operations will see results from subsequent operations. Uh, and that means that you could get corruption in the read uh, the, the write will probably be okay, but uh, whoever is reading it before may get tearing from, for example, if you were to write to uh, an output buffer, an output image, while an input, while it was being used as, for example, a texture, uh, then whoever's reading it might get some mixture of whatever state was before that, that access and after. Uh, right after write, if we don't serialize these, this hazard means that we don't know what's going to end up being the last write. We could get some mixture in the, in the final output of earlier and later operations. Uh, these other two, there's some additional uh, parallelism inside uh, Vulkan, for example, within uh, within render passes or also between operations uh, uh, submitted to different queues where we really don't know, uh, there is no sense of what is before or after. There's no definition of what's before or after that we just know that these uh, can happen in parallel. So uh, again, with the uh, rights racing rights, it results in some mixture potentially of the rights from the different parallel operations and any read, racing, or write, it may get some mixture of whatever was a prior state or a subsequent state. Uh, again, this is this is happens when unsynchronized unsynchronized subpasses or queues uh, happen. So we will we'll bounce back to this when we talk about validating synchronization. So hello race conditioned. You know everybody needs a hello world program, and here's our hello world. I'm going to read from buffer A and copy the region uh, designated by region into buffer B. And then I'm going to say, well, I'm done with buffer A, so I can write, I'm going to write something new to it from, say, buffer C. Well, the problem is, of course, that given the, the uh, parallelism and the pipelining in the, in the execution, that we may not be done reading from buffer A by the time we start writing to buffer A, which means buffer B will have some admixture potentially of what was in buffer A before and what's in buffer C now, which is not desirable. So we will uh, put in an execution barrier since uh, we just want to make sure that we're done reading for buffer A, all we need is an execution barrier where we say, the source scope is going to be 
the transfer stage because we want to make sure that operations in the transfer stage are complete. And the destination scope is also the transfer stage because we don't want anything in the transfer stage running until everything prior in the transfer stage has completed. And this is a fairly large mallet. We could actually refine this down to just only operate and limit accesses to buffer A, but this is the simplest uh, way to prevent the, the right after read hazard that the hello race condition code shows. Pipeline stages are the way we, again, specify the uh, state, the operations we want to uh, wait or to wait for. They are logically ordered, and that logical ordering is defined in the Vulcan spec for each type of pipeline, uh, compute, transfer, graphics, uh, uh, ray tracing, all of them have their or the ordering of the stages that are within those pipelines. The source stage mask uh, is logically extend the source and, and destination scopes are logically ext extended. So if I wait for a stage in my first synchronization scope or my source scope, it also waits for all earlier stages. And if I tell a stage it has to wait, it also causes all later stages to wait. And so you can frequently just get away if you're just doing execution, if you're just doing execution uh, synchronization with just a few bits uh, to cover uh, everything you need. Access masks don't work that way. There is no logical extension either uh, before or after. Access mask bits require that you explicitly set all the bits in all the stages that you are interested in masking uh, access operations to. So such that, and we saw this frequently, it's a, a common error that, that when we tested uh, synchronization validation against a publicly available source, it was a common error uh, to think that, oh, I want to uh, cause all the shaders to wait. So I'll just tell in the desk stage mask, the uh, we'll just wait at the vertex shader stage and, and therefore, and then I'll ask for in the access mask, I'm going to have shader reads wait, and therefore all shaders will wait for all reads. Well, this isn't true. If for every shader stage I wanted to wait shader reads for, I had to set the bit in the desk stage, stage mask. So uh, that, that was a common error, thinking that the logical extension from execution mask, uh, the execution uh, mask in the stage mask also applied to access masks, but it doesn't. It's explicit. Uh, every access you're interested in at every stage. The pipeline stages are 64 bits now in synchronization two because they ran out of, of bits. And synchronization two, I believe, uh, was uh, made part of core in one, two, or one, three. Uh, Jeremy, if you can look that up. So we can have a better answer. That would be great. It's 1.3. Okay, thank you. Uh, the valid values that can, you can use are based on what is the queue you're on capable of and what kind of pipeline you're in, as well as the extension features and whether you're in a render pass or not. The special values, none, top, and bottom of pipe, and we'll discuss that below. All commands blocks everything, all graphics, applies to everything in a graphics pipe. And uh, transfer uh, in synchronization two got broke up, broken up into four, uh, a, a greater granularity for copy, blit, clear, and resolve operations. So you could wait uh, for them in a more precise way, but the transfer stage is effectively those four bits uh, all in one. So if we look at the pipeline stage, the orders of orders of pipeline stages for graphics, you'll see top of pipe uh, through bottom of pipe with a bunch in between. 
uh, with the logical extension, as we discussed before, if we're in the first or source uh, scope, uh, if I'm waiting for vertex into input to complete, it also waits for everything before that includes draw indirect and, and top of pipe, which is a no op uh, to complete, uh, as well as vertex shader. And if I have that in the second execution scope or the desk scope, then we wait for then then the things that will wait are everything after vertex shader. Note again, this doesn't apply to uh, accesses for each of these stages. So all commands in the source stage waits for all stages to operate is essentially a wait for idle on the GPU. If you say none or top in source stage, you wait for nothing. If you say none or bottom in the desk stage, you also, uh, uh, nothing will wait. Uh, however, you can use uh, uh, dependency chaining, which we'll talk about later, to actually wait for things. And again, semaphores and fences specify uh, sometimes only half of the stages uh, in part of the commands, and events will specify uh, your source and destination scopes uh, separately. Uh, that's true in, in semaphores and true in events. And render passes specify these scopes in the subpass dependencies, but we don't want to use the implicit ones. So again, with synchronization two, access masks were expanded to 64 bits, and there are several extensions that require using the access bits because they only are defined for them in synchronization two. Uh, if you're not using those uh, features, then, then synchronization two is not a requirement. The valid bits that you can use in access masks are only the bits that are corresponded to the stages that you specify. Uh, if you specify stage transfer, you can't use shader read. If you use a shader stage shader, you can't use a transfer read. Uh, so there are there are now VUIDs that the core checks will uh, trip for you if you have synchronization two enabled. Uh, memory read, memory write is not only GPU but GPU and CPU uh, synchronization. Shader read uh, has been uh, again made more granular in synchronization two, but will operate. Uh, in a backwards compatible way covering all granular, all granular stages. So let's talk about how to establish a memory barrier. We showed it an, uh, an execution barrier example earlier in the uh, hello race condition uh, code. Now within a, a VK command pipeline barrier, as well as a few other places, you can define a memory barrier to control what accesses you want to wait for and what accesses will wait. And you, again, specify it as, as we, we talked about in the, in the source and desk access masks, which specify what sort of accesses you're going to wait for. In sync one, these are correlated with source and desk stage masks that are global to the pipeline barrier command in sync two, they are per barrier, which is, which is um, nice in terms of getting better granularity. You don't uh, add additional potentially spurious uh, stages uh, to your memory barrier. Note that if you have more than one memory barrier within a pipeline barrier command, they're all independent. So when we talk about uh, ex execution dependencies uh, later, uh, nothing, there are no dependencies between barriers within a given uh, synchronization command. So there are sometimes we've seen code where people have treated memory barriers and thought they could uh, chain between them within a single pipeline barrier command. This is not valid.
one of the roles for for uh, barriers is also for changing the ownership of an exclusively owned resource uh, such as a barrier or a uh, buffer or an image. And that's done by specifying who is, you know, what's the source family index and the destination family index. On the source Q family, you have a barrier that specifies the source and dest, and the source is, is the one that you are specifying. That's a release operation. And on the uh, a Q family that is going to be the new owner, it uh, specifies the same source and dest, but it's, it's submitted to the dest Q family. That's how this works, but it really only applies to ex to exclusive mode resources. The, uh, they really just for good practice should have the same source and dest access masks, but they are uh, ignored in turn. Destination is ignored on the source queue and source is ignored on the dest queue. The pipeline stage masks, are, masks however, apply to both. Note that when you release a resource on a queue, any access after that is undefined. Image barriers also allow ownership transfers and are how image layout transitions are implemented. So if you lay out an image in layout general, you can do all operations to that image. All valid operations to images can be performed in layout general. The problem is that it's not in a memory or uh, a memory layout that is optimal for anything in particular. Uh, I believe that present can only be done in the present layout and not general, but uh, you could check the spec to see if I'm wrong on that. The image layout transitions are used to rearrange the organization of an image in memory so that each type of use is optimal. And the transitions happen between the first and second execution scopes of the barrier. And they happen at no stage, according to the specification, which means that you have to in order, and they act as a full image sub resource read write operation, which means that in order for them to be safe, your source stage and access barriers uh, uh, masks must cover all prior uses uh, such that you avoid the, the hazards. If you had pre-existing writes, then you're going to have to wait for those writes. If you have pre-existing reads, then you need an execution barrier between uh, in your source, in your search stage mask. And then to have operations be non-hazardous against the layout transition, then you, all subsequent operations are going to need to be specified in the destination stage and access masks. So render pass, we could spend an hour on render pass and still probably not spend enough time. This is a feature that is mostly used in mobile and is important for mobile because it, it supports uh, tiled rendering efficiently, allowing for some parallelism uh, that uh, of, of work on tiles and reducing memory bandwidth. But fundamentally, you organize work into subpasses that say, what are the inputs and the outputs for that subpass? And what is the order and even what subpasses can happen in parallel? And then transitioning your, those resources between a, for example, a 
frame buffer output and a texture read input. Those are the kinds of things that would happen at render pass barriers. The render pass uh, dependencies uh, act like their memory dependencies between the subpasses uh, in the source and destination and uh, act as memory dependencies and have the same rules in terms of logical extension for the stage masks and no logical extension for the access ma uh, masks. If you do not include a subpass dependency, you will get a implicit subpass dependency, which is effectively a no op. And uh, and if you're using the implicit subpass dependencies, then you're probably doing something wrong. Additionally, within render passes, there are load, store, and resolve operations, where if you are loading into an attachment that you're going to read from, then you must also assure that any layout transitions uh, have the appropriate uh, destination stage masks, uh, the, uh, protecting the load operation from, uh, from the image layout transition. Uh, pipeline barriers are, are interesting because you have to also define a subpass self-dependency source equals dest, uh, and you can only use certain pipeline stages for pipeline barriers within uh, a subpass. And those and those uh, subpass dependencies don't affect the outside world unless a sub source or destination is external. And I, again, the split the implicit external subpass dependencies probably don't do what you want, especially if you're doing any image layout transitions. And the layout and layout transitions can happen at any subpass barrier as you define it. Let's look at the implicit subpass dependency that is defined for you if you don't define one. Notice that the source stage mask is none. And the death stage mask is all commands, which is interesting. It says everything waits for nothing, which is fairly useful. And it says none of uh, that, in fact, all of the attachments also wait for nothing. This dest stage mask pretty much assures that the only thing that is safe by this implicit subpass barrier is an image layout transition. Uh, but that image layout transition itself isn't safe relative to anything. So if you have a barrier outside your render pass that weighted all your work, then this implicit subpass would say, aha, our any layout transition that's going to happen going into the subpass from external, well, everything that happens inside, inside the subpass is going to be safe, but we're not safe relative to any operation outside, outside the render pass. So again, not entirely uh, useful. So you usually have to think about what exactly you need your subpasses to wait for So let's moving on. All, everything we talked about so far were operations that happen within a command buffer. But we also obviously can commit, uh, submit many command buffers. So there's additional ordering rules, and that is the queue submission order and the signal operation order. These are things that I encourage you to read through. But effectively, it's, it says, that on, on top of that, it says that the order of operations beginning at top of pipe are commands within a command buffer, command buffers within a batch, batches within a submission, submissions in order, and very similar for signal operation order. Now to impose additional order between command bu uh, buffers or specifically batches or submissions of command buffers, 
there's semaphores, fences, and host events, which we are not going to discuss. Semaphores allow synchronization between batches of submitted uh, command buffers. They cover either the same or the or different queues, and they will assure that operations that are covered by these, these semaphores happen in an ordered way. When I signal a, a semaphore in QSubmit, the original QSubmit, it waits for all stages and all operations, or it assures that all stages are operate and our operations happen before the semaphore is signaled. In that sense, the semaphore is the only second scope. And all operations are done, done before that. In QSubmit2, it allows you to specify a stage mask and then applies to all accesses for that given stage mask so you can re restrict what the semaphore signal will wait for. And in Acquire, which is not covered in validation today, in Acquire, it also says, oh, that the image is done being used by the presentation engine. So you, you can now uh, access it. In Wait, it's waiting is similar, uh, though kind of the reverse, the first scope for a submission is the signal, is the semaphore itself. So we say everything in the first scope happens before the semaphore and everything in the second scope happens after the semaphore. So in that way, everything in the first scope of the signaler happens before everything in the second scope of the waiter. So it's broken up in the same way that uh, events break things up but it restricts only the stages that are in the wait stage mask. And uh, in submit to it's, uh, I'm not sure that statement is right. I will, I will, I will review it. I think it, I think no, it's that's, still. that's correct, John, that uh, it's just that the, both the signal and wait operations have their own stage mask. So the wait ah. they works the same way in, oh, in I see. Yes. one and submit two. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's it's all executions effectively. All right. So uh, for binary semaphores, you have to have submitted a signaling batch uh, before you wait. And with timeline semaphores, the semaphore value at each signal is strictly increasing. And it has well-defined rules for waiting for a semaphore that has not yet uh, has not yet signaled. So for fences, so semaphores are really for keeping command buffer submissions in order. Fences are for keeping the host ordered with the with the GPU. So the first scope is is all device operations and accesses. So when a fence is fired, everything before that fence is done on the device. The fence does not, however, include any uh, memory coherent, coherence uh, operation. Uh, it's signaled from the device and it's signaled from uh, the following operations. You wait for them on the host or you can query for them on the, on the host and once, you're, once they have signaled, you can reset them. So it's in three stages. Do I have, do I drill down more? I don't. Uh, the details for wait for fence is interesting in terms of, uh, it's one of the calls in Vulcan, unlike many, where you really need to look at the return code to know what you're being told. Uh, for example, you could wait for many fences. And if you only, uh, if you tell it in the wait flags that you only wait, want to wait for the first fence to be signaled, all you know is one of those fences was signaled and to determine which one you would have to 
uh, query the fence uh, status uh, individually. Uh, and you can, you can wait for fences with a timeout. So potentially you could wait, get a return, but none of those fences have fired and it's the return code that tells you. All right. So um, we have some questions, John. Um, sure. I can give a take a stab at um, answering them so that you can have a, a little break. Thanks. Um, sure. So the first one's from Vishal. Can I use Vulkan with only compute shaders? Yes, you absolutely can. You just need to create a compute pipe pipeline and whatever memory you uh, need to use. You don't need to use the graphics pipelines at all. I believe there's some Vulkan samples code that shows shows this. Um, we just talked to someone yesterday who was using Vulkan compute on a platform where they don't actually have a display hooked up. Um, so, so yeah, there should be plenty of examples of that. The next question is from Nick. I update a storage image in a compute pass, image load, then update value, then image store, and then read it from the main graphics pass. On just one platform only, I get corrupt values for the image load. Would this usually be a memory barrier issue or can even image layout mistakes cause this? So that, that does sound like a, a memory barrier issue to me. Um, that's something that, that synchronization validation should be able to find for you. I think if you were in the wrong image layout, you could get, uh, get, a, get similar behavior. It seems a little bit less likely. I think core validation should be able to catch that for you. Um, yeah, core validation should tell you if you're in a yeah. valid layout. Uh, yeah, but, but again, as, as we said that um, GPU architectures are different. So it, 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 it's definitely possible for problems like this to only show up on certain platforms. So yeah, I would try synchronization validation and see if it, if it can find the problem for you. Um, the last question is from Zeslos. I'm sorry if that's not correct. Uh, why is there a need for explicit queue release acquire when two commands submitted in different queues wait using semaphore? Um, so queue, uh, release acquire operations are required when you're going between queue families, not necessarily between two queues in the same family. And the release acquire options are about um, any hardware specific um, memory su subsystem requirements that are, are different between the two queues. You could imagine that you have a graphics queue that has its, its own memory or hierarchy, and then you have a, a, a transfer queue that's a really simple DMA engine. And they um, the, the hardware, the two pieces of hardware need to know when they're using, using that memory so they can um, have it in the right formats and, uh, and have any cache operations happen. Yeah, is another, there much? Another great example would be, uh, you know, I I have no, I have worked on graphics adapters where, for example, the video decode engine is literally a bolted-on piece of hardware. It has nothing yeah. in common with the graphics. So you have a queue. And all it does is video, and you may have a queue that does everything else. A queue family that does everything else. In order yeah. for that video engine to process it, it may want it in a completely different memory layout. So uh, as opposed to having that same image, for example, be concurrent, meaning that it, its memory organization would have to be in some least common denomination, denomination format, denominator format, which would probably be highly inefficient on both. You. Yep do both the transfer of the memory hierarchy ownership in the Q family ownership in, on an exclusive resource basis and the image layout transition to be efficient on both, uh, both functional units. I mean, I've literally seen, I've literally worked on hardware like that. Yeah, and if you're doing, if you're sharing an image or a buffer between two queues in the same family, you still need semaphores to ensure that operations in one queue complete before the operations in the other queue start. And that, that's fairly cheap. And then the follow-up question we have is, is there much performance penalty in doing queue transfer? For example, which is to best, best to do to transfer in same queue and use a barrier before doing graphics or transfer in transfer queue and then do graphics? I would say that um, 
that usually if you have a transfer queue that can be working in parallel with your graphics queue uh, and um, you'll get you'll get overlap and work in work that um, will uh, make up for the any overhead related to do the queue transfer. Um, we've also been told that uh, queue transfer for buffers is is usually very cheap and it can be more expensive for uh, for images in some cases. Um, but yeah, if you have a transfer queue available that that can run without without using graphics resources, that'll that'll often be very advantageous. But with anything, it's best to profile and and make sure that's true on the hardware you're working on. Thank you. And that's me. it. That's Thank it for the questions stuff. we have now. So now that um, from the nearly stunned silence, we we uh, see the complexity and difficulty of the problem. Let's talk about how we can sort out whether we're we're getting it right. In all in all of this. Uh, remember that we are validating correctness, not uh, whether something works or not on a given platform, meaning that you will find many technically working applications that will not validate clean, but the purpose of checking for correctness is that if you are correct, then you are portable to platforms you haven't uh, tested on potentially. Uh, and so that is, that is why this may seem uh, overly strict uh, in terms of your experience, meaning that, that you will see synchronization validation errors occur on systems that appear to, to function well, but that's the same with you know, any multi-threaded or parallel programming is just because it works, it doesn't mean it's right. Um, which makes it rather a paranoid uh, <laughs> task. So synchronization validation uh, does uh, looks for the hazards that we discussed above, and we'll review them in a second. Uh, what, where are we missing synchronization operations that would make a series of, of accesses correct and safe? And we look at the, the, the hazards as we define them above. It functions at byte resolution, which is the, the resolution of the Vulkan memory model. Uh, it covers all VK command types at record time and select operations between command buffers. It has sync to support, uh, though fairly limited other extension support. For inter-command buffer support, we have uh, released support for execute commands. And in beta now, we have uh, validation between command buffer batches from QSubmit between host and uh, for host syn uh, synchronization, we have fence support and uh, uh, device wait idle. For QSubmit, we support both uh, fence and semaphore synchronization but only binary semaphores. There is limited aliasing detection uh, for liked kinds of, of resources right now. If you bound the same memory to a buffer or uh, and an image, we would not catch uh, the aliasing conflict. We aren't uh, currently tracking the swap chain operations, so that's work in process um, on my desk as we speak. Uh, we don't do host side resource access tracking. We don't do Swizzle support, and we're not uh, GPU assisted. That that is the state of synchronization validation today. Again, reviewing the hazards that we looked for, the read that we have not waited for a write to be completely retired before reading. We uh, we write before a read execution has completed. We write without waiting for prior write operations, or we have in parallel operations, either within a subpass or across multiple queues, a completely asynchronous read and, and write operations. Notice that reads and reads happening at the same time is not a problem uh, in general. 
Uh, although if you have reads that are dissimilar types of reads that would require different image layouts, then the image layout transition operations will likely show up as one of, uh, one of the uh, mentioned hazard types. Our theory of operation is we look at the accesses that are represented by each command. And we, we look at it in stage access pairs. We only keep track of within a command buffer, the first access for a given uh, resource byte uh, and the most recent access. There is within the uh, design documentation, uh, a, a theoretical argument that, that essentially says, we can get away with tracking only the most recent state because if the current access would have hazarded against a prior access, either it will hire, either it will hazard against the most recent access or the most recent access would have hazarded versus that prior access. Um, and again, there's a bit of a discussion in the design document about why why we believe that's a, a valid model. We also track the impact of synchronization operations again at each byte to identify what, what operations have been marked safe from the, the access, accesses that we track. We also track dependency chaining. And I, I said I would get back to this and I'll do it now. There is in the document a very difficult to read section in my opinion about how different synchronization operations apply to each other. The easiest way to think about it, and, and this is not the way it's written, but I believe it's correct. You can look at synchronization operations pairwise and cumulatively for a given byte or resource. If a synchronization operation applies in its first scope, either to the operation that occurred at that resource or to any operations that have been marked as safe. In other words, if my first scope matches a prior accesses, uh, a prior synchronization operations second scope, then my second scope also applies to any uh, any resources applied by the first synchronization operation. And this is where this is where it gets confusing. So I'll now transition to the source and destination uh, alternate way of describing it. If in the source scope, if I have two synchronization operations, if the destination scope of the first operation matches the source scope of the second operation, then those two operations are said to chain, meaning that uh, any, it also applies, it expands effectively the source scope of the second operation to include the source scope of the first operation. And that's how you can add uh, additional, for example, write dependencies off of a execution dependency by chaining your source scope to prior destination scopes. Also, it applies cumulatively, meaning that once I have merged kind of this larger source scope of the two operations, I can treat that as if it was a single prior operation and apply that same part pairwise logic to any subsequent synchronization operation. Hopefully when you go read it in the text, what I just said made sense or, or perhaps you can rewind it and listen to it later. But when it's an important element in getting your, uh, uh, understanding the scope of, of, of the synchronization operations. Finally, it validates, uh, we validate subsequent accesses popping the stack. What's the theory of operation? When a subsequent access comes in, it says, oh, 
what was earlier accesses and what accesses are safe between them. We report hazards. Uh, and as we said with this most recent logic, if we reported an earlier hazard, uh, we may not report all subsequent hazards. So don't, when you fix one hazard, you may then expose that there are more hazards. All right, when we go to use uh, synchronization validation, here's how I've been able to make it work and been able to, in the real world, debug issues, even in code I didn't know. The first thing you want to do is make sure that you have 100% validation clean application everywhere else. Because synchronization validation assumes that the command stream you're giving it is valid in terms of parameters, and valid in terms of the things that core checks, um, is valid in terms of uh, thread safety. Uh, it just it doesn't check, and so because that would simply be uh, duplication, and it's heavyweight enough, we recommend that you don't run it with the other validation. Uh, operations enabled. So make sure it's clean, turn off everything else and enable the layer in the layer enables. Uh, I give the, the, the text there. It's also in the SDK, what the correct settings are. Uh, and it's also, uh, I think we've had it in an earlier white paper. I tend to record these things in my project files for debugging. Uh, they can put, you can use VK config or, or you can use layer settings. It all kind of runs through the same way. Then when you go to validate this, turn off every other bit of validation and run your code in the debugger using debug action break or breaking in a callback from a debug utils uh, messenger extension because you will then get a break in your code at the, at the point at which the error has occurred. The errors are a little dense. And if you just simply try to read them and say, gee, where did this happen? You have a very small chance of ever finding where your issue was. So that's the best practices for getting going. And let's, in fact, demonstrate. Let's go through a live demonstration of this. Here it is. You should be seeing my, my desktop with a Visual Studio application running. You'll notice I've got a breakpoint set here in the error callback. Jeremy, can you see that? Yep, it's you can possibly make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, hang on. How's that? Perfect. Okay, so we've set a callback. We've set a breakpoint on the callback. The code I'm running, and uh, ironically, I'm, uh, this is one of the Vulcan samples. I thought, hey, I'll get Vulcan samples and I'll break it in a in a in a predictable way, and then I'll show people how how to find where I broke it. And it turned out I didn't need to break it. It was broken to begin with. So we'll go ahead and start the debugger. Let it start up. And here we are pretty early. And in fact, we are in, if we look at the call stack, we're in the GUI setup. So let's take a look at the error message, which is in the callback data, in the P message and bring it up in the text visualizer. So there is a typical uh, validation error. It's a little dense, so let's, Let's unwind that in the slides.
So congratulations, it's an error. There's a lot going on in this error message and we'll break it down. But before we do that, let's take a little bit of, you know, we have to think like we're synchronization validation. So how does it think? First thing it thinks in is it does not think in stages or accesses, it thinks in stage access pairs. Because as we said earlier, for any given stage, only certain accesses are valid. And for any given access, only certain stages are, are valid. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, this we've enumerated internally and exposed in the, the form that I show sync uh, stage access. There are also meta stages for non pipeline operations, such as layout transition. And when we get to the presentation engine uh, validation uh, exposed, that will also be a meta stage access for things again that don't help happen at a, at a pipeline stage. And synchronization validation thinks about what prior commands touched a given memory location and includes the implicit operations. And how does the current operation use that resource? What's its stage access? And then what sync operations uh, have affected the prior access that would, uh, that would make safe or not safe the, the, current, uh, the current access? So let's break that, see how those four pieces break down in the error message. Again, they're very largely in this form. We have the current command. This is what this is this is whatever API call is happening. This is the kind of hazard. And in this case, we have a write after write. We have some command specific information. In this case, I've got a, an image barrier. So I'm going to list the uh, the image that's involved. I'm going to say, oh, what am I doing right now? What usage is hazarding? Meaning what is the current usage of the current command? And this is an image layout transition. What, what was the last thing that we did to this image? Oh, we did a transfer write. What have we done in terms of operations to make this safe? Well, there's no right barriers. And what command was used uh, for this prior um, access that could be useful for finding into the code? And then we also keep track of what command was it within the command buffer? And as command buffers are frequently reused, which use of it? So this was uh, the second time this particular command buffer was written. That's previous command, where within that command buffer it was, and what what usage of it. Uh, the command specific details, as we highlighted, are command specific and copies, dispatches, barriers, render passes all uh, cover uh, different material. Um, render passes have those implicit operations, the load star resolve. Uh, image barriers and render passes have layout uh, operations, draws. Uh, we'll refer to descriptor bindings, attachments, and bound buffers, copies, source, destinations. So now that we are experts at reading the validation error, uh, let's go back and take a look at it. And you should be seeing that same error message we had before. And I appreciate, uh, apologize for the size of the text, but you'll notice that we pointed out that right bar barriers were zero. And in our discussion of image layout transitions, we said that given that we happen between source and destination, then this says that somewhere in our source mask, our source stage access mask, we have not set a write barrier to protect the image layout transition happening within this pipeline barrier. So let's see if it's anything local. Climbing up the call stack. 
into the application. We take a look and you can see that I've been here before. We can see this uh, pipeline barrier being set and we can see that the stage mask has the one bit set, which I believe is the transfer, which is the transfer bit, if I remember correctly. And then this is going to be uh, probably a shader read, if I remember correctly. But we can get those variable, vari those values up another, another level and see what the call looks like. Let's go wider so we can see it. Yep. We said, oh, we're, we're going to have an, a, a barrier and we're going to wait for the transfer stage. That's good. And we're going to um, have a fragment uh, stage, fragment shader stage, wait for it. But notice that we don't have any accesses that we're waiting for. So we have no write barrier present. And this is the moment, the cooking show, where they reach under the uh, table and pull out the goose they cooked for two hours. And this is, this is the correct thing, because we, are, we were told that the prior access was a transfer right. That means that's the access we have to wait for. And the source stage was already correct, because the transfer right is a valid access for the transfer stage. And if we we slice this pre-cooked goose, we will discover that we're going to go a lot longer before finding that there is yet another uh, yet another error, error, and this is this is the workflow. It's uh, it's very much a rinse repeat because of the way we we look only at last access. It's it is the uh, it is the case that as you fix one hazard, you will expose potentially uh, later hazards uh, that were not caught in your first in your first pass. But that's that is the that is the process. So let's get back to the slides. Looks looks easy, right? So let's talk about what we found frequently, as we just saw missing, uh, missing stage access, uh, missing stages or, or uh, accesses is really where you get it. You either have some, someone who assumed that stages were logically extended for memory access, and they're not. Remember that for any memory access, you must list the stage explicitly. Uh, it, it also will, within synchronization one, you can have invalid stage access pairs without any validation errors. Under synchronization two, many VUIDs were added to uh, flag uh, invalid stage access pairs. Uh, we saw also that relying on the effectively no-op implicit barriers between subpasses or subpasses and external, uh, and uh, the not paying attention to the fact that image layout transitions are full sub-resource read-write operations, which means you need to protect them in the source uh, scope and protect from them in the destination scope. And because they happen at no stage, you either have to chain with your source scope uh, to make sure that image layout transition is safe. And you have no choice but to specify uh, the desk scope to protect you because Image layouts 
stage uh, image light transitions don't happen in a stage, you don't have another chance. So if you don't specify a de destination scope for an image layout transition, you will have a hazard. And uh, of course, missing, uh, oh, uh, this is actually a different one. Within render passes, uh, stage, uh, the load operations and the store operations for color and depth stencil happen at different stages. One is at color attachment stage, the other is in either early or late um, depth of access, but they're at different stages. And so if you only set one of those stages uh, before the store operations, then maybe only your color uh, attachments or only your depth stencil attachments uh, will be considered safe. And also note that even though you say that your store op is uh, don't care, within the spec, this is still treated as a right. There are extensions that suppress that, but by default in non-extended behavior, uh, store ops that say don't care are still treated as uh, rights. So how do you fix this? Well, by inspection, as we saw, take a look up the call stack and see where you are relative, you know, what read write barrier is closest to, closest to your access? Uh, and then look at, and then look very carefully at your error message. Your error message is telling you a lot of information. It says, oh, if you say my write barrier is zero, zero, then you don't have a barrier, even if you think you do. So now you have to ask yourself, why is it you don't have a barrier? Did you not have sufficient stage access? Were you making assumptions? Was there some access that happened between your last barrier and this one that you didn't realize? But you also have your sequence number. Uh, so you can start using your debug extensions to uh, name command buffers uh, and you know, start paying attention to where within the command buffer you are, break your command buffers in half, you know, start doing things like that to localize the commands. Uh, you can look at at that prior, yeah, let's say look at the prior usage to see what kind of access is going on versus the current barrier. Look for the last layout transition. This just happens all the time. Uh, when's the last time you changed the layout transition and make sure that you really made it safe versus what you wanted to do. Uh, and then when you have a hazard at a layout transition, as we had, uh, look at your source stage masks or look at your earlier barriers to make sure that the affected resources really uh, have been uh, uh, protected from your, uh, your full read write. At an application level, you know, every Vulcan, every Vulcan application has an, an application level engine or is using an engine of some sort, which means you're tracking resources in their roles, whether they are, uh, you know, a, tr a transfer buffer, whether they're being used as a, as a uh, frame buffer, whether they're being used to sample from, every resource changes its role, resources change their role. And it's at these role changes from read to write, from write to read, and, and thankfully these happen frequently with layout transitions. Um, that's where you're going to get a lot of your hazards. So tracking where these role changes happen and looking for where these role changes happen to make sure that you're, you're tracking this. And this may involve changes to kind of the metadata within your own engine, uh, but it's for, for debugging, look at that, Look at that. I remember, and and uh, I'm very uh, thankful to the Godot team that was supportive when I just kind of took on Godot in a pre uh, pre beta version uh, when they were porting to Vulkan, and I was using it, and I was navigating through code I'd never seen before. But as I was able to see in the code where they track the role changes for their resources, all of a sudden the source of various synchronization operation uh, 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 operation errors. Uh, what became very clear. So it's a very useful, it's a very useful uh, meta technique. 
again, as in all, uh, as in all uh, multi-thread uh, debug, there's always the method of, of bisection with a big hammer barrier. Go in and insert a barrier that makes everything wait. And if it goes away, then you know where your weight is missing. Um, if it doesn't go away, that means the missing barrier is later. And so keep moving it. And by method of bisection, you'll very rapidly find where in your application you're missing a, a barrier. Do not leave this in because uh, while you can make all your your bugs go, your bugs go away, you can also make all your performance go away, and that's not good. And as you make changes, as you add uh, barriers throughout your code, as you're fixing, go back and turn on core parameter validation to make sure that it's still valid, that you uh, haven't uh, missed that you have that the code you've added is is not only appears to be correct for synchronization, but it is correct in terms of uh, the larger corpus of validation checks. And that's that's all I've got. So I'm ready for uh, for more questions. And yes, my my voice can use a break, Jeremy. I'll let you attack them. Okay. Um, let's see. So we have a question of if the slides will be available later. And yes, they should be posted on one of the URLs. Uh, I don't know, but Karen, Karen's taking care of that one. Um, put a direct link into Slack, or into, sorry, into the chat window too. So the- Okay. Should yeah, I'll put the chat in. Cool. Uh, so the next question is, what hardware in indicator can generally be observed on a profiling tool, such as NVIDIA Insight, if the synchronization is too loose? Um, I, say, I would say that if you're, using an all commands pipeline stage barrier, you would see portions of the GPU go idle, even though you know that there's work that needs to be done. And if you're, um, if you're doing too many memory access masks or, or masking everything, you might also see that, that the memory bandwidth utilization is higher than you expect because you're frequently flushing and invalidating caches that you don't, um, necessarily need to be flushing in and validating. So GPU going idle, memory bandwidth going high is what I would say there. Yeah, that's, where, that's for too tight. Yeah, too tight? Okay. Yeah, that's too tight, right? If you've got too much synchronization going on, then you're going to have idle GPUs, right? Yes. So what if, for too loose, you'd be getting errors. I guess it depends on how you interpret too loose and too tight. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that, that tool in specific. But if you, if you were to start seeing operations, say between a compute engine and a render engine that you think really should be serialized, you know, if you're, if you're doing, let's, let's solve for the particle location, let's draw all the particles. If in, in the timeline layout of your tool, those two start overlapping, then maybe you might go, hmm, <laughs> this isn't what we want. So I would think that would, I, I, I would think, you know, looking at the sequence numbers or what metadata the overlapping bars indicate, right? If, if, if uh, you know, the particle solution for frame zero is overlapping with the drawing of frame zero, as opposed to the particle solution for frame one overlapping with the drawing of frame zero, uh, then, uh, then, then that might ind indicate too loose, would you think? Yeah, that, I mean, it seems like if it's, if that was happening, you probably, you probably should be getting some sort of hazard, right? Because if you're trying to display stuff that you're still calculating, right, that'd be bad. Yeah. But um, with, with sparkly particles, you might not notice. Might not notice, that's true. The, the artifact, because they're kind of blinky particles. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's the problem, right? Correctness and apparent correctness are two different things. Okay, so the next question is very open-ended and I like it because it's the programmer's version of Spinal Tap where we have a scale that goes from zero to 10. So say zero is, is a single queue and blocking all commands every time and 10 is using dedicated queues with most granule, granule sync. 
how should a Vulcan application decide what area in that range to aim for? So I would say you, you want to be beyond zero. You want to use the, the stages and access masks that make sense. But maybe if you're just getting started or you're, you're doing hello triangle, and you just want to see something on the screen, that's fine. But then beyond that, I mean, you're going to have some sort of performance goal and you want to meet that performance goal as simply as possible. Um, so you, I, I would start out with a single queue and, and if you're not meeting, uh, if you're leaving portions of the GPU idle or you're not meeting your frame rate goals, then you start looking at more, more advanced um, techniques with multiple queues. Um, but it's, I mean, that's going to be an art and it's going to depend on what you're trying to accomplish and how, how complex your program is. And there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff on the internet about that. Um, AMD and NVIDIA have pretty good presentations on, on multiple queuing and I'm supposed to have my video on. Um, on multiple queuing and and uh, advanced programs like that. Probably the best one I've ever seen is that there's a, a SIGGRAPH paper about Doom Eternal from several years ago. And if you can dig that up, it, it'll blow your mind. The, the things they, they've done in that game engine are pretty amazing. Anything yeah, to add? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's, that's probably exactly right, is, is you want the minimum such that you don't have hazards, but you also don't have these stalls. And that's, and that's, and, and, you know, uh, I, I used to work with a guy by the name of Terry Murphy and Terry Murphy's law is if you're not measuring, you're not optimizing. So, you know, I sometimes look at, at the, ver the diversity of tools. For example, is it, if I have 32 images that I need barriers for, is it better to have one memory barrier or 32 image barriers? And the answer is, well, I should probably write it and I should probably test it and I should see uh, what that output is. So uh, that kind of fine grain optimization of, you know, can I get away with a me memory barrier? Well, if I put in a memory barrier and I don't create massive stalls, then I'm probably good. If I create a stall and I go to, well, okay, we're gonna then transition each one of the images in its own barrier, you know, with its own barrier, and it gets better, then uh, then that's that's your win. But I think you I think you have to, uh, you know, do the do the least you can for it to be correct, um, and then, you know, tailor it to make sure you're not killing your performance. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Kronos Group for uh, sponsoring this and making it uh, possible. Yeah, thank you, John and Jeremy, for this amazing presentation. A lot of great information here. Um, these slides will be available as well as a recording of this presentation. Uh, they will be put on the Kronos Group website. There'll be a direct link sent out to all of the attendees um, and anybody who registered for this webinar. So watch for that coming in the next day or two. Um, and if anybody is looking to get more involved, um, we've also got some, some great options for um, people to chime in and ask questions um, and get more information. So make sure to stay tuned. We've got more vulcanized um, webinars in the future. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks again, Lunar G for this great presentation, John and Jeremy. Take care everyone.